corrupted. Burn the box. Well, I'm going to be talking about Starflight. The um, brochure says finding habitable worlds. I'm talking about actually reaching them. And for a number of reasons. Well, it's just cool. Um, <laughs> but the survival of humanity depends on it. That's a kind of a little detail that's sort of important. It might be impossible. I've got to be about that. And what's really the part that I like about it, and this is where the cool comes in too, when thinking about it, it's a way of, to use the cliche of burning the box. And so I'll be saying a little bit more about that. Okay, um, when talking about, it's so hard when you're just dealing our existing day, and for right now, kind of our concept, unless you're uh, cheating by doing phone calls right now or, or texting, your, your per perception of our existence is this room. But, you know, all of humanity just lives on, as Carl Sagan would say, that, that blue dot. And I like that picture because it also has the moon in it. And that was taken by the Voyager spacecraft uh, back. And, and what's nice, too, is through astronomy, we can find out about a lot of other uh, worlds out there. And even through the colors there, you can tell whether or not there's life. But one thing that you could not tell at that time, even from that photograph, which was taken in the 70s, that leisure suits were considered fashionable. Um, but the other thing to keep in mind is that, uh, and at least, um, you know, Earth is not going to exist forever. In about five billion years, the sun will go uh, supernova, and maybe sure that there we go, and it will cook the Earth, or not supernova, it will go into a red giant, and that's for sure. What's uh, less for sure are all these other doomsday predictions that might happen uh, quite a bit sooner, um, and I read one thing about an asteroid site that right now our first warning might be the uh, flash of light and the shaking of the ground after it hit, um, which is kind of a, uh, a bad thing. So when it comes to what's an exit strategy from that, uh, two possibilities that uh, I'll go into um, are the idea of colony ships, which I'll say a little bit something more, or trying to find another Earth. And so what are the prospects of that? Well, other habitable worlds? It, it just to imagine, uh, it hasn't happened yet, um, but imagine if we ever discover that there is another Earth-like planet out there, and it will just be like this inaccessible jewel beckoning us. Uh, what has been happening is over 400 exoplanets. An exoplanet is a planet around another star rather than our sun. Over 400 have been discovered, but they're the easy ones to discover. They're big. And none so far have been habitable. They're harder to find. They're smaller. Well, the idea is, is that um, what do you look for instead? Well, so far the idea, and these are all kind of preliminary, is these are other suns that might be um, the kind of thing where a habitable Earth could be around. And the other column there is the number of light years that they are away, the closest one being 27 light years away, and the uh, farthest of that five is 50 light years away. And, you know, if you don't know what a light year is, in space, it's, it's kind of hard to determine. We think light is so fast, but in space, light is really, really slow. And light, the fastest thing we know, takes 50 years to go that far. And this is only five possible areas of a habitable uh, planet. Uh, another uh, colleague of mine started doing, how many people know what the Drake equation is? Okay, that's enough, I'm not gonna explain it. Um, he's <laughs> He started doing the statistical version, including the error bands and stuff, and some in, uh, uh, initial inputs, the closest possible intelligent life might be 500 light years away. Now, this is very provisional estimates, so don't take that as a, a firm answer. Uh, it could drastically change. So if the habitable planets, that might be 50 light years away, um, and there's no intelligent life on them, all the better for us. Um, but now, here's a comparison of getting there. Light, like I said, is the fastest thing we know. And when I put the four up there, our nearest neighboring star is like 4.3, 4.4 uh, light years away. And the fastest human-made object, the Helio spacecraft, and that's the speed that it's at when it's its closest approach to the sun. That's not its average speed. That's an advantageous one. If it was going that fast, it would take 19,000 years to reach our nearest neighboring star. Now, if we include the other range for the possible habitable uh, star systems, we're talking age, ages or time frames that are equal to about how long Homo sapiens have been on this planet. So if you had Homer sapien was able to launch something like the Helio spacecraft toward a star, it might not be there yet. Um, 
So that's what we're talking about just from uh, normal travel. Now, time is not the only issue. Spacecraft, if you've ever noticed, use these rockets where they spew things out the back. And the farther or more you want to carry, the more propellant you need to carry, and extra propellant to propel the propellant, and it adds up exponentially. And I won't show you the equation, but here's an example. Send something the size of the space shuttle to our nearest neighboring star with 50 light, uh, in within 50 years, that's less than 10% the speed of light, and uh, use the best conceivable rockets, that number is debatable. So, you want to guess how much propellant that's going to take? And this is just for a flyby. Yes, that's our sun, the entire mass of our sun. Um, so, you know, the people on Earth are going to be really pissed off if you use our sun. <laughs> and worse, that's, uh, if you wanted to stop when you got there, that's how much you would need as your braking propellant. And that same ratio between the little shuttle and the sun, you need that ratio from sun to lots of other suns to be your starting propellant. So pro the, the mass issue is another one. But there are ideas for space flight, like sails, actually this is a hybrid, that involve no propellant. But that's not all there is to it. There's energy. Now on this chart, um, what this is, is this is, uh, and it's a logarithmic chart, which is why it's in a straight line, the power growth of our human ability, our prowess for generating and consuming power. Um, and both the low end and the high end predictions there. So somewhere within that band is the likely trend of how much power uh, prowess will have over the years. And the question comes, well, how does that compare with an interstellar mission, even something simple as a probe to our nearest uh, star system? And uh, by the way, in this energy thing, I, I should be clear that this also includes the sub-proportion of energy that's actually devoted to space missions, using the space shuttle as a comparative example. So um, any one of these factors, if you adjusted it by virtue of debate, could shift it. But according to Trends as they appear now, uh, the soonest that we could launch a probe to Alpha Centauri might be two to four centuries away um, using conventional physics. And uh, with this, there's a whole bunch of ideas that are brought forth, all based on existing physics. And the catch is, is thank you, um, there's no best single method. And that's because there's no best single reason for why to do the attempt. Now here's just a, a simple comparison of some. If your motivation is to be first, whether to be first to launch or to be first to get there, um, then you want to find optimum opportunities. And then that's really hard to do because there's so many competing factors. If the issue is survival of humanity, then you want to start looking at the idea of colony ships, of sending a self-contained segment of humanity out so that it's going to be far, far away from our solar system when our sun dies. Um, jumping down to the next one, about another way of reaching habitable worlds is undiscovered physics, and that's the stuff that I like to do, um, which is a challenge unto itself. Um, if you just want to discover habitable worlds or see if intelligent life is there, well, then you can just stay on Earth and look and listen. Um, I mean, presuming they're going to be near enough by. Um, and if it's just scientific curiosity, well, then we're in the realm of discretionary spending. But the point is, is depending upon why you want to do interstellar flight, it will drastically change what approach you take. And um, just as one warning, for those who want to be the first to reach the destination, you have this that you need to worry about, the incessant obsolescence postulate, that no matter when you launch that first probe, a more modern probe launched later is going to catch up, pass it, and reach a destination sooner. Um, <laughs> Actually, this is just a postulate. This will fail under a number of conditions, uh, like if we uh, uh, really stagnate technologically for a long time, and I will avoid the temptation to say something political. Um, <clears throat> or if a, a closer destination is reached, or uh, any, and also there's a case that you can reach an optimum time when you consider nonlinearities of growth and, and the relativistic things, but that gets into a whole other issue. Um, the idea of colony spaceships, and I don't have any examples here to show you, even there's been some. The main point is, is that even though technologically it's conceivable that we could start to think about building these things, and it's a, a huge energy issue still, but what these are really good for is trying to is understand ourselves better now. I mean, what is a sustainable size of a human community? Is it 500, 5,000, 50,000? And how much do you need to have a closed loop life support in terms of continuous energy? Um, we conveniently have our sun. A colony ship is going to have to have uh, something that lasts indefinitely. Um, 
and also that, that has infinite reliability. But what about the form of governance? And what is a meaningful life if you're trapped on this, say, a shelled out asteroid or whatever that uh, you're going on, so that these people in their future life, we're so used to the idea of growth here as being a life motivation. Well, if you're on a limited size, and actually the Earth is a limited size, which is one of the things to figure out here, what is our ultimate population beyond which we're in trouble. Um, but taking a look at these things is a way of exploring even these issues now. And now I come to the category which I lo like uh, about burning the box. And this is one uh, quote that I like in dealing with it and one of the ways I go about thinking of it from Arthur C. Clarke, um, who, by the way, we got him to agree to do the foreword on our book one month before he died. Um, so Bert Rutan did the foreword to our book and said, but anyway, um, you know, to find the limits of the possible, go into the impossible. And one of my favorite places for the impossibility is uh, science fiction. And this is a collage of a whole bunch of science fiction ideas of Starflight, and they make it look so easy. And they make it so alluring, too, with Captain Kirk having sex with so many aliens. Um, <laughs> but, um, but the undiscovered physics, we're talking about space drives, meaning some means of moving a spacecraft without using rockets or beam power. And, you know, and faster than light travel. I'm not going to say that much about faster than light travel because it's actually more heavily in the literature and also is related to some of uh, Sergei's uh, work. Um, uh, but the uh, space drive will say a little bit more. But the idea of is this impossible? Well, I don't know. But one thing is for sure, you are not going to make progress by saying it can't be done. And uh, just to get you thinking. Now, I have... I could go on for this for hours, and this is really fun stuff. I'm just going to give you some examples of what it's like and what modes of thinking you get uh, doing this. So here we have some representation for our entire universe, that circle, and a hypothetical spacecraft, a generic-looking one that shouldn't remind you of anything. <laughs> and the question is, well, what if it reacts on the mass of the universe and propels itself? A uh, spacecraft moves in one direction, and the universe moves in the other relative to what? Um, this requires uh, issues about um, inertial frames and such as that. And by doing these sort of things, you really get into some provocative questions of physics that aren't normally thought about when trying to figure out the age of the universe or something like that. Now, how many of you have ever done the thing where you, it's called a soap boat, where you have put something in water and touch the back of it with detergent? Anyone? Okay, some of you have. And it might have been in your childhood back when leisure suits were popular. Um, <clears throat> well, I, I'll say skip that. Um, so here's our generic uh, spacecraft, and uh, we put a small amount of soap behind it. It's floating on water. Change is the surface tension of the water, which pushes it along. The spacecraft had no propulsion. You changed the space. And in this case, the water was the reaction mass. So if you try and think of analogies to that, to what if you change space-time? Then it gets into the question, well, was space-time a reaction mass? Again, these are just one of these uh, mental tools to start playing with these ideas. And um, here's yet another one. Uh, the question is, if you started the engines, all those masses around there, how are they going to move? Um, evenly or as a unit? And that gets you into a whole other realm of how you start converting these ideas into the math so you can do the calculations and uh, hopefully find engineering solutions. And this is kind of a, a wrap-up on the, the main points. Interstellar flight, even though it seems so long now from fruition, um, at some point it's going to be necessary for the survival of humanity. And if you want one thing as like an, an earlier step in thinking and as a way of better understanding our limits to our life on Earth, you can start thinking about colony ships. And if you like burning boxes or burning other things, um, the idea of pondering this undiscovered physics of space drives and warp drives and, well, tr by the way, transporters is in a whole other arena by itself, even much harder to talk about. Um, but, you know, it opens up interesting lines of thinking that aren't within the normal realm of uh, physics, the age of the universe, and such as that. I mean, just think about it. If you could know the age of the universe to five decimal places, that'd be kind of cool. But would it help you compared to if we could discover means of actually getting out there? I think that would be a lot more interesting. And just as the uh, closing slide here, um, yeah, uh, that saying ad astra incrementis means uh, to the stars in steps, where each step is greater than before. And at this stage, 
you know, to find out what are the next critical questions that we can begin to answer to step away at this is what myself and some of my colleagues are uh, trying to do. And not just for the ultimate gain, but because of what you learn in the process, even if this remains impossible. And if this remains impossible, we've got five billion years, we've made a better make good of it. Thank you.